Hey everybody, thanks, thanks for joining, joining us for another uh, Cold Little Squared live event here. And uh, joining us is Mike Wall from uh, Selma, Arizona, and John Cook from the Nebraska Volleyball World Headquarters <laughs> there in Lincoln. And uh, you guys are looking good there in Devaney. Um, how long have you been in that office setup? Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for another uh, Cold Little Squared live event here. And Ready to go here? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Chris, we moved in here in 2013. It was the first year here in the main, and we remodeled this and uh, made it a volleyball facility. And uh, I've been able to visit and hang out with you guys, and uh, they, you know, of course, uh, did it right when they, when they did the remodel, and you guys have had unbelievable crowds there in the center, huh? Yeah, but, uh, the uh, seating capacity is 7904, but we sell 300 standing room only seats up above the top up there. So our average attendance is around 8200. Um, and in that, we have five sky boxes. Also, we have 100. Uh, let's see, uh, we 128 courtside seats on the end zones that people pay extra money for to have those seats, big cushy seats. Um, so. We're, we're actually, uh, we've been generating a profit every year since we've been here. Uh, and uh, so it's pretty historic for women's volleyball for a program to do that. But because of the skyboxes, because of the course side seating and selling, you know, almost 8,000 tickets, uh, it's allowed us to, to do really well financially. That's awesome. And I think I met you uh, for the first time maybe back when you guys were still in the old arena and you were still selling that one out. And uh, my dad and I, I think we did a, a coaching clinic over maybe on the Iowa side, in Council Bluffs, and you brought your staff. It was back when the, when the two Dans were there, and we got to go out, my dad and I, and hang out with you guys for maybe a weekend. And um, just, it was amazing to see what Nebraska the University has done in support of volleyball and what the programs that have kind of preceded you, and then, of course, what you've been able to do there. It's been remarkable. And I think um, it's one of the things people probably talk to you a lot about, just, hey, how is it possible that this has happened in Lincoln, Nebraska? And, uh, you know, I think it's just it's, it's awesome what you guys have done and what you're doing, and pretty fun to see that success. Well, thanks. But, uh, you know, I, I, uh, when I speak, I talk about, I think, volleyball is in the DNA in the state. Uh, yeah. There's a place in uh, Paxton, Nebraska, it's way out west, it's Cattletown, and uh, they have a famous restaurant there, this guy was a big game hunter, and so it's, if you're driving out west, you, you, you gotta go to this place, it's kind of one of those tourist places you stop, and uh, so anyway, I was in there one night several years ago, and these ladies were back there having a party, and uh, they were talking about in the 60s and 70s playing volleyball in the sand hills, which is all cattle country. Uh, it was nine on the side. I think they had different rules. I'm not sure all how it worked, but they started telling me about you know playing back then. And I think you know I grew up in California. I don't think girls volleyball really started going until the 80s uh, that I can remember. And uh, so I would say it's in the DNA here, and, and uh, you know so it's become a really big deal. Yeah, well, you guys it's certainly made the most of it, and. Uh, we're I'm I'm super fired up to have you and just can't tell you how much we appreciate you taking a little bit of time here. I know you guys are in the middle of practice time, and uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you. And, Mike, you got uh, kind of the theme for today, um, some interesting subjects that we're going to talk about with John. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, John, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, one of the things that I've always been intrigued by, and we've had conversations on the national team about, uh, from time to time, is just how different every year is when you're a coach. And there's there's not a whole lot of absolutes in the world of coaching, but that might be one of them. And that's it. Uh, no no two years are going to be the same, and, and you're always going to be faced with different challenges. And with with the national team, we we have mostly the same roster for most of you know through through most of the last squad and into this squad with a few tweaks here and there. But in the world of, uh, you know, NCAA women's volleyball, changes can be drastic from year to year with, with uh, people graduating, people transferring, and uh, with assistant coaches leaving, and, and there's always changes, things like going on. Uh, 
uh, in your world and in any coach's world. And so I just thought it's a really uh, great topic to talk about. And, uh, and I've heard Karch on some of the broadcasts during some of your final four matches talk about how you had to do this with some of your teams. And so uh, we're looking forward to learning from you and hearing what some of your experiences are. And I know starting back in 2009 and 2010, there was some, uh, from a personal perspective and also from a team perspective, you, you had to uh, do some reinventing, and then uh, I guess we could start there and, and go from there. So, uh, yes, all good stuff. And uh, um, so in 2009, uh, so we need to back up. In 2008, uh, I probably coached the most overachieving, fun group of players that I ever coached. Jordan Larson was on that team, and we ended up. Uh, beating Washington in one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. Uh, coming back from down 0-2, down 9-3 in the, in the fifth uh, out of Washington uh, to win it and come back to Omaha. I and mean, we ended up playing Penn State in the semis. And most people say it's the greatest match they've ever seen. A lot of people told me it's the greatest sporting event they've ever seen. And that's the Penn State team that hadn't lost a set all year. And at the time, we were, we were starting three walk-ons. Jordan Larson, and, and then uh, two other kids that were on scholarship. So it was this team, like, how are we doing this? It was a magical season. It was Jordan's senior year, and it just shows you how, what a great player she was. That she would literally will and carry a team. And, and uh, so anyway, after that season, uh, in the spring, all of a sudden it just hit me, like, okay, what's next? We, we sold out. We just played in front of the biggest crowd ever in Omaha. Uh, how can we ever top that season? And so I kind of hit the wall and went through what I would call a mental and physical burnout. And I just, I just thought, okay, is coaching where, you know, is it going to be, how can I have any more fun than we just had? What's next? I just felt like I had nowhere to go. And so I actually thought about maybe it's time to get out and, and try something else. And um, so the way the story goes is a, a, a mentor of mine, said, you know, you got to do something um, to get your mind off of volleyball and not be so consumed with it and not make it be who you are. And, you know, as a coach, you're always trying to prove yourself. And a lot of times, our how we feel about ourselves is how by how well our team does. And so I had to let go of some things. It was a really good process. But anyway, I took up, I started trying to play the guitar and I uh, took lessons because I wanted to be coached by somebody. That lasted about a week. And I had a really good guitar teacher. But the other thing I did is I went and got my pilot's license. And, uh, and I, was, I got this really good instructor. He actually flies for Southwest Airlines now, which is one of the hardest airlines to get on. But uh, anyway, when you're learning how to fly a plane, you don't think about anything else but flying that plane. And the other thing that um, I learned from that was I think this was like a defining moment in a change in my coaching career. We were working on crosswind landings one day, and it's very difficult to do. It goes against all your instincts. And anyway, I really, really struggled with it. And I said, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this. I can't tell you, like, it's too stressful. And he, just, he told me, you've got to trust your training. And that really resonated with me. So I actually have on my clipboard or my notebook, you know, I write a note, trust your training. And so I'm trying to get me to trust our training, our team to trust our training. And that kind of just changed me as a coach. Gave me something new to work on. It gave me a diversion from volleyball. I started feeling better. And I uh, took off on, on that path right there. And, uh, and, and so anyway... But we went also in a spurt there from 2008 to 2015 without going to a Final Four. So I was getting questioned a lot. Okay, w what's going on? You guys aren't the Final Four. Well, one of the reasons is college volleyball got a lot better and is, continues to get better. There's a lot of teams now that can go to the Final Four. Um, so, again, it was kind of a struggle period. And, and um, through that, I did a lot of self-reflecting and learned a lot. And was able to apply that, and I think it's really helped me become a better coach. So that's the, that's the first part of it. Um, the reinvent part is I think what that stems from is I had to reinvent myself as a coach. And the reinvent was if I continue to do what I was doing, 
I was burned out. I wasn't going to get anywhere. I wasn't a good coach for our players because I, sh- I know they sense it. And I know, you know, if the coach isn't happy, how, how the player's going to be happy. So I really had to reinvent myself. So I did a lot of things. I, I, like I said, I got my pilot's license. I committed to working out really hard. I start, started uh, stu- kind of studying uh, mindfulness and yoga and things like that uh, to help, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, be more healthy in that regard. Uh, and if you, anywhere you go, you can look. There's people that are into it and can teach you. Um, but also, it helped me start looking at how to how to rebuild teams. And I don't like to use the word rebuild because rebuild means something was broken. So if something's broken, you have to rebuild it. If you reinvent, and this was our theme starting actually in 2015, and that year we won the national championship, but we had a complete new team turnover and I just thought okay we're going to reinvent uh, our team this year and I'm going to reinvent myself as a coach so I've got to do some things that are going to help me be better and have a new version of myself each year and that's how this reinvent theme kind of started that Karch just referred to and it really became important the last two years because the last two years we turned over our entire roster I turned over my entire coaching staff and uh, all, with the exception of two players, Michaela Fecky and Kenzie Maloney, those are the only two, of them, you know, up to their senior year last year that were left, and me and, our, and Lindsay, our director of ops. So we really had to reinvent and and with a lot of new people and get them on board. And you know, I'll pause there, and you guys can ask questions or, or something else you want me to elaborate on. But I can also talk about some of the things that we do to to and reinvent and how we approach that with the team. Yeah, Chris, you, you got some? I got some. If you don't. Yeah, well, so I think one of the things that you hit on, John, that I think is really important is there are principles and foundations that are immutable, that are always there, that are always in place. And that kind of is this foundation that we're maybe always reinventing upon. What do you feel like are kind of the like this never changes. We're not rebuilding because this is always good. Uh, we feel like, you know, this is something here at Nebraska that we can always count on. It's always sustainable and we're going to keep doing this no matter what. Are there things like that that you feel like permeate across time? Um, you know, Chris, uh, I, I, I think, you know, if I had to say one thing, it would be hard work. You know, Nebraska is the state of Nebraska works hard. It's a farm state. I mean, people take pride in that. Our football team's known for that or was known for that. Um, but that's coming back. You know, it's the first thing the new football coach is talking about is how hard they're going to work and uh, their new strength coach and so on. So they're trying to get that back. So I think that's the one thing that never changes. Um, but I think what we've learned to do in this reinvent process is – each team has to figure out what they're going to be about, what their culture is going to be about, what their themes are going to be. And so what I've noticed is each year, and this is our sports psychologist, Dr. Brett Haskell, has really helped with this, and she started with this in 2015, was helping these teams figure out what they wanted to be about. And I think that's what I found interesting in coaching, that it allows them to have their personality, be their kind of team, and they figure out what is going to work for them. And, and of course, we facilitate that. We continue to make it a theme. And, um, and I, I can give you some examples of that if you want over the last Yeah, no, I'd love to, I'd love to hear what uh, – and, and that's interesting for me just because of the notion behind letting them – discover that is maybe a little counterintuitive. A lot of coaches feel like, hey, look, uh, values are going to come from the top down. Themes are going to come from the top down. Um, um, you know, putting this out and they're going to adapt it or adopt it. And uh, it sounds like you guys kind of maybe went the other way and said, all right, we got some stuff, but what are you guys about? And let's figure that out from your level. So, yeah, I, what, what did they come up with and what, what yeah. did you surprise you? Okay, I'll, I'll, so, you know, and some of this stuff I think is, sometimes I think it's kind of corny and, you know, but you got to adapt to this generation, you know, and, I, you know, as we get older, you know, that generation gap gets farther, but uh, you, you got to adapt, I think, to be a great coach because, 
you know, and I, and again, my point in changing in 2009, I also had to change as a coach on how I uh, approach things and how I dealt with this generation and, and the, or this generation that's currently going through right now. It's different than when I first started back here in 2000. The kids are different. Everything's different. So you've got to adapt. And that's one of the things I had to learn to do or I, I would have never survived. But I'll give you an example. And um, after 2016, we graduated four All-Americans. And um, so we had some big shoes to fill. And we had this big uh, freshman class coming in. So I, I just actually was thinking in the 2017 season, okay, this is just going to kind of, you know, be a fun season. No, no pressure. Don't worry about it. No expectations. And because we had so many new kids and we graduated just four great players. So one of the things they came up with uh, during the summer, um, besides this reinvent part, um, was the first thing is we came up with that June, um, and going into the summer, that June, the U.S. dropped the Moab bomb in Afghanistan. And they called it the mother of all bombs. So our team took this motto, we were going to have a Moab summer, which was the mother of all summers. We were going to work harder you know, with our strength coach, but they had to work really hard to bring those freshmen in, all these new players, bring them together. So we just said, we're going to make a commitment. We're going to work harder than we've ever worked before. So that was one thing that started that team off. The second thing was they came up with, which I think is, in fact, I got a patent on it. It's, it's with each other for each other. And so they said, no matter what, and they had this, we put this on bag tags, we put it on shirts, we just, everywhere we could put it, W-E-O, F-E-O, with each other, for each other. So that's how they were going to play. And we actually went to the point where we would take out video clips of showing them what it looked like and showing them what it didn't look like. So when a team's coming together and they're working together, you can really see it. And when they're pulling apart, you can really see it. So we showed them video of us, we showed them some videos of 2016 when our team fell apart. We show them this is not a team playing with each other for each other. You can see it in their body language, their eye contact, all those things. So they really embrace that. And, you know, sometimes it's good to have a young group uh, because, you know, as Pat Riley says, they're on the innocent climb. So they're open to all this. They're, they're, it's fun for them. It's exciting. It gives them something to, you know, to um, hold on to. And the, and the third thing that team came up with was, which I thought was brilliant, was why not us? And they actually, in the word not, N-O-T, they put a big red N. And so we had that on shirts and put whiteboards and all that stuff. Why not us? And that was kind of a theme. They put it in their ready room, locker room area. So why can't we be the, the next great Nebraska team? And I'm thinking, okay, all that's great. You know, this is all great. Is it really going to make a difference? And I really learned it. It made a huge difference. And because that team went on to win a national championship, and I, I would have lost my mortgage uh, if I bet on that uh, <laughs> against that team at the beginning of the year. But, you, you know, um, and I saw some kids that just blossomed uh, in that season. Um, but... The bottom line is when they feel safe and they feel connected and they feel that, that with each other, for each other, it really allows players to be in their comfort zone and to play their best possible volleyball at, at the best level they can play at. And they're not, they play fearless. And that team played fearless. When you say safe, what uh, safe and connected, can you talk about that a little bit more? Where, safe with their relationships, with each other, with you guys? Um, how, how did you define safe? Um, there's a book called Culture Code. Um, I'll think of the author here in a minute. We actually use it as a book study. And this author, Dan Coyle, and he goes and studies six really successful groups. San Antonio Spurs was one of them. Uh, he studied uh, Zappos. You probably know what Zappos is. You got girls. Shoe company, yes. Company. <laughs> So they study why these companies are so successful. And the number one thing through the whole thing was all the employees and the people that work there feel safe. They feel safe and they feel valued. So we worked really hard to make everybody feel that they're comfortable. There's no outcasts. Everybody can speak without being judged or cut down or people rolling their eyes. So we've created this culture and this environment 
um, where everybody feels safe and, and again they feel valued. So whether you're an all American or you're this little freshman walk on, you have a say. You're important, and um, you know, and we create this safe feeling for them that they're a part of this group and and they don't even worry about what people think and, and getting judged and things like that. Yeah. And then from 2016 to 17, uh, maybe another kind of big transition year for you guys. You know, a lot of turnover with personnel. And what what was that? What was the group thinking? Was the one that went into this this past season? You guys battled down to the last few points in the national championship match. I don't think many people saw you there. Uh, or would have predicted that either, but that group found something pretty special and put it together, huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll go through what happened this past summer, you know, leading up to that. Um, so just to put it in perspective, we had 15 players, eight of them at the start of the summer, or at the start of the season, had never played at a point for Nebraska volleyball. And we were playing, starting and playing for freshmen all season. So the first thing was, um, uh, as they went through their summer and they're defining their culture, Michaela and Kenzie were, like I said, the only two people that were left over from the previous three years. So their whole thing was they, and they weren't thinking that we would be in a national championship match. They were thinking, okay, we're just going to defend what we're good at and what Nebraska volleyball is about in our culture and what we want. So they actually made this list of this we will defend. That was one of their themes. And we put that in a ready room, locker room area. It's still down there now, but it's just it's things like we're going to be on time, we're going to work hard, we're going to treat each other really well, and some of the other things that we have uh, within our, our team culture, like P2P, we're going to talk person to person to resolve things. So they listed all those things that were important to them over the last three years, so that was really powerful. So that was a great way for them to educate our younger players on this is what we are about, and this is where we're going to defend every day being a part of Nebraska Volleyball. The other thing that I think was really, really big, um, and <clears throat> if, you, if you watch Michaela Fecky in the, in the interviews after the national championship match, and listen to what she has to say, it all comes out. And if we can narrow it all down to one thing, it, they came up with this uh, logo. It says, we divided by me, and their whole thing was it was going to be about the team and not about one player. And, again, I would encourage people, I don't know if they can go on YouTube or find it, I've got the clips that uh, we share with our players of what she's talking about. It's about she just came off a great match, just ended her career, and all she talks about is the love of her teammates, the support of her teammates, how much all this means to her. She could care less, you know, what happened. I mean, she, of course, she wanted to win. Uh, but it was all about the relationships and that team that she was a part of and a leader of. Um, you know, it all came out in that you know really stressful end of the season you know moment. And so that just proved to me all the things they worked on really were you know in their hearts and they really embraced it. And here's our leader and best player being able to verbalize it. You know, after a very emotional five game loss in the national championship. Yeah. And it's probably hard to overstate the value of that individual. You know, Michaela embodied kind of this notion of just, you know, this is what you're after from senior leadership or from a leader within your group is somebody that, that when potentially could take all the credit and the spotlight could shine very brightly on that individual, but she's, she was deflecting it the whole time, and no, no, it's this team, and it's these other kids, and how much I love playing with them. That was, that was pretty unique, I thought, and it was pretty fun to just, as you say, that's what came out. It wasn't rehearsed. It was just in this moment, how do you respond? Well, you respond with what's in your head and what's in your heart, and that was what was, that was, what was there for her. Yeah, I mean, Chris, what, what makes it amazing, the thing that I uh, kept hearing her say over and over, I mean, she played... That was her fourth senior year. She'd been that was her fourth straight final four. She'd been named MVP of two final fours, won two national championships. And the thing she talked about was the closest team she'd ever been a part of. And remember, eight of the fifteen were brand new. Yeah. But I think as a leader, and one of the lessons for to pass down to other leaders, and we this is what we're talking about with the leaders we're trying to develop right now, is Michaela 
put everything she had into it. And, you know, her heart and soul went into that group of people that she was a part of. And that's one of the reasons she said she felt that way, as I think she really connected. And I think leading up to that, I never thought Michaela would be a great leader here. But she kind of, um, her senior year, she figured out what she was going to need to do. And she made this great effort of, again, making those kids feel safe, making them feel a part of Nebraska volleyball, educating them on this is what we're about. And it was very powerful. And, again, it allowed us to play at a really high level, maybe higher than what we were, you know, should have. Yeah, I thought, I thought you guys for sure punched above your weight class. class. Yeah, it was, it was neat to see. Mike, Mike you were uh, – you had a follow-up. Yeah, I think uh, something that would be really helpful for, for our listeners is this idea of, the, you know, the influx of young athletes into a program. It's something that everyone experiences at all levels. Uh, new teams, new athletes, young athletes. And I remember I was having a conversation with Troy Tanner uh, quite a while ago, actually. And we had a young team at ASU when I was an assistant coach there. And I was talking to him about, you know, how do we, how do we prepare these kids and how do we help them get into the Pac-12 and Pac-10 at the time? And he said something that I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. And he says, just let them be, let them be naive. Just let them go, you know? And, and, you know, to some degree, I still buy into that. Just let them go play ball and let them uh, go compete and let them think maybe they're better than they are and, and all this stuff. And, and, it, and it worked out quite well with that particular group. And then we had a you know, pretty big inflow of, of youth in, with the national team. And, and at some point, we had to stop talking about youth. We had to start talking about you guys have been there and, and you know, we need to start talking about let's win some gold medals, you know. And, and uh, how have you handled – youth and that message with them have you talked a lot about with your teams about how this is a young team and here's what we need to do or have you kind of fallen more along the lines of uh we're just going to focus on the team and 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 uh not going to pay so much attention to actual age in your conversations um <laughs> this is going to be a little different than what you just talked about but the first yeah. thing I tell those freshmen when they get here and I, you know, I started as a football coach way back. That's what I really wanted to do. And, of course, they made me coach girls volleyball, so that's how I got into it. But um, there was an old football coach in Texas, Daryl Royal, and he always used to say, if a dog's going to bite, it's going to bite us as a pup. So that's the first thing I tell them. If, you know, if you want to run with the big dogs, you, and you're a puppy right now, you've got to start biting like the big dogs, you know, and, and you can't wait till you get older, you know. So you're going to do it now or you're not. The second thing we did, like I said, we started four freshmen. So every day when they come into practice, we just get our, you know, go to the whiteboard, corner up, and I said, hey, we're only going to be as good as these freshmen today. You know, you guys, you guys aren't ready to go today. It's going to take the whole thing down. We're only going to practice at the level you can help us practice at today. So I think we ended up having six freshmen total on the team before it started. So I kind of put that on like a responsibility, like, You've got to come in and perform every day. You've got to be ready. You can't have freshmen take freshman days off, which a lot of times freshmen, you know, they just can't grind day after day after day at a high level. Um, that's the second thing. And then, then at some point when we get to November, I tell them, hey, you're now sophomores. So your freshman days are over. We're going to turn, getting ready for the tournament. You're now sophomores. So you got to, you're under your belt, so play like sophomores. So I, I'm not... So yeah, we do talk about it in those ways, but I'm not, um, but I'm not making excuses like, hey, we're really young, we're really that. I never do that, but I, I work those guys uh, from that mindset. They got to bring it every day, just because they're freshmen, they're homesick, it's tough. They can't, they can't do that. They got to, like I said, they got, they got to run them with the big dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good, good stuff. stuff. Chris, you got a follow up there. Well, just I know Marv Dunphy talks about that in his way, too, and he says one of the kind of qualities of elite players is there's an urgency. They don't feel like they've got time to be good. They feel this urgency to be good now, and that starts translating into their behaviors and their actions and their work ethic is there's this urgency that they feel to be able to perform and to be good now, and they don't, like John, like you talked about, they don't take freshman days off, you know. They're going to have them for sure, but they're working through those in a good way. So, yeah, that's uh, yeah, interesting. That I like the way you guys talk about it. That's good. 
And, uh, and, and we said there, I'm going to use that on my team today. <laughs> just yeah. some inspiration for today. Thanks. Awesome, yeah. But just, I, and, I, and I think just from my coaching as well, that you find that there are some, you know, common denominators and your practices are only ever as good as some of these people allow you to be. And uh, I just I like that idea of putting some pressure on them and then helping them come up so that the level can come up. And as they come up, now we can really get going because now we're at this pretty special level in practice because you guys are bringing us there. Yeah. So, you know, I studied the Navy SEALs, and I actually have a Navy SEAL commander I talk to a lot. But, you know, one of their things in the Navy SEALs is you're only as strong as your weakest link. And that's what they, you know, a Navy SEAL team is 16 guys. Well, volleyball team in the women's game is about 16 usually. We average about 15 or 16. So a lot of similarities, but they're talking, you're only, and of course, they're doing things that they have, they have to rely on each other to, to survive. Uh, but it's a great way for them. Hey, we're only as strong as our weakest link here. So, and that's, you know, you guys can't carry your load. You're going to pull everybody else down. Yeah. So, uh, but it, you're right. It does create a sense of urgency. I've never thought about that before, uh, you know, with our players, I think. And, you know, they're not going to be great every day, but at least they're going to be working towards it. Yeah. Man, Mike, Mike, do, go, go ahead, ahead Mike. Mike. Yeah, I'm just thinking about urgency. And, and sometimes it just organically forces itself upon you, you know, we <laughs> thinking about the Rio Olympic Games, and again, I think maybe it was eight or nine of our roster were first-timers uh, in, in the Olympic Games, and we can't come out and get spanked by Canada, and uh, then we lose to Italy, and now we have to play Brazil in Brazil uh, to even make it out of pool play, and uh, and it took, it took getting beat up and smacked around a little bit in those two first two matches for our guys to settle in and and, uh, and sense the urgency, but also to, to learn how to play in the Olympic Games. And so uh, that was a <laughs> – that was – we felt definitely felt the urgency there. Yeah, John, we've got, um, we've got some listening listeners that just want to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Great. These people aren't working? Yeah, they're shipping out. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're like us. <laughs> they're in the middle of the day hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got Megan, who uh, – the with each other for each other philosophy uh, in the team practices was that something that you came up with or something that the girls came up with and how how much did you drive that versus how much did the team drive that so the, the way it works is in the summers technically coaches we're not allowed to meet with our team and work on those things you know we're hands off in the summer um, so our sports psychologists will work with our team on developing those themes. So that's the team and our sports psychologist going through meeting every week, and they talk about what they want to be about and, and, and all those things, and that's where those themes come out. So with each other, for each other, came out from a team, from that team. Uh, and I don't know what players it was because I'm not in those meetings, but that's what evolved. And then on the first day of practice, the, the day before our first day of two days, we can meet with them, and we have administrative meetings and all this, and then we meet as a team. And they present to us, the coaches, what their themes are going to be about. And ironically, back in 2015, that year, they actually performed a skit for the coaches on what they were going to be about. They had video, they had music, they dressed up. So that's how much they got into it. <laughs> and so to answer Megan's question, this is it's all player driven. And anytime anything that comes from players and it's player driven is so much more powerful than a coach putting it on a team. I mean I can go tell them, hey, this is what we're gonna do and you know, we could go out one year and out the next and they're not bought in. But when they come up with it, and again we talked about it earlier, everybody feels valued. So everybody feels a part of that. Now you got a whole group of people buying into that. And they present it to the coaches and then we buy into it. Right on. We've got uh, another question from Joe. Uh, now, remind me, you guys, did you guys move an outside to the middle or a middle to an outside that ended up being quite successful? Well, Michaela Fecky was in the middle. We moved to outside. Um, she, she was, was a, a, she she was was a right, right side for a while, too, too right? Uh, we tried her on the right. And I think when you were here, we were trying her on the right and didn't yeah. go so well. <laughs> yes. Well, but she, she was in the middle of the week. Uh, converted. Um, we had Capri Davis was in the middle, who we converted to outside. Um, 
trying to think of who else. I mean, we've had a couple of other ones uh, that we that we have, uh, but I don't know that's what they're talking about. Michaela talked about for me. Michaela was the leading kill getter for the junior youth team in the world championships when they got a silver medal. She led the kills in the whole tournament as a medal. So um, that's how good a medal she was. Yeah. The, the question is uh, just that process. And, and I guess getting a, it's obviously a scary thing for an athlete who's already really good in one position to hear a coach say, Hey, we're going to move you to a new position, especially at a, at a high level. And uh, what was the process like um, the sales pitch or if, if there needed to be one uh, in order to benefit the team? Yeah. The other, I know the other big move that happened when like, Chris was around, we moved Amber Ralston from right side to the middle. She became an All-American medal. I think that's the girl I was thinking of, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there's been a couple moves, but, uh, you know, uh, this is where, you, you know, players have got to trust their coaches and what we're doing. And, of course, we put a lot of thought into it, and then we share it with them and make the move and train them. And that's the, you know, we see ourselves as a training program. We're trying to get our players better whatever position they're in. Uh, are playing, but uh, I think it's just trusting that you know this is why we see this. This is your chance to help the team, and we think you could be this outside hitter, or we think you could be this middle because of these reasons. And if they trust it, you guys work together. You know, it's it's works out. And uh, um, at the end of the day, it's still volleyball, but uh, I don't know. We you know football does it all the time. Uh, you know, they move guys around and until they find the right spots. And I think that's still part of our job. And, and not some club coach who's pigeonholed them somewhere. Michaela was in the middle, for example, because she was the biggest girl. She comes from a town of 600 people. You know, she's the biggest kid in high school, boys or girls. So they're going to put her in the middle of the That's what volleyball coaches do. Um, but I saw this great arm, and I thought, okay, if we can get her more swings on the left uh, than, than with this great arm than we can in the middle. And so... That, uh, you know, that's that. And Amber was actually a really good right side, but she was such a good blocker. I'm like, okay, Amber, you're the best blocker I've ever coached. We got to get you in the middle so you can block from pen to pen, not just out there on the right side. And, and you know, she just blossomed with that. It's like, you know, she got this confidence. And when I told her, like, you're the best blocker I've ever coached, and she was. She's a phenomenal blocker. I mean, she just took off. And so... I don't know if it's that blind luck or, you know, but again, we put a lot of thought into it. Yeah. And what year was that where she moved to the middle and did well? She was a right side for her first two years, 2013 and 14. And we moved her in the middle 2015. Yeah. All American. So she won a title in the middle. Yeah. I remember watching that match and of everyone on the court, she stood out to me the most. She was pretty impressive in that spot. All right, that's going to lead into another question here. And uh, buy-in is always a hot topic. You know, people struggle with kids that, that are not buying on, buying into either, you know, being moved to a new position or uh, maybe some of the, the team culture stuff. Uh, do you have any tips for our listeners on, on buy-in and how they can – I'm sure it's, 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 a, it's a big question and a complex question, but anything come to mind there? Well – the old coach cook would say, "You don't want to buy in, fine. Go find some other place to play. <laughs> but on bench, you know. But on bench, the bench sends a message to the brain. Like I don't like sitting on the bench, so I, mean, I got to figure out how to get off of it. <laughs> uh, but I think actually uh, starting to work with Chris Thomas, Ty Hildebrand, and now Jalen, uh, and those guys have a lot of experience in the men's game." I've learned how to be take a softer approach to that because I think in the men's game, and I go to a lot of men's practices, and this would be one thing I tell any young coaches out here: go watch other people's practices. So, for example, um, this year um, I, I, I go to the USA gym every year, watch both the men and the women, and uh, I also uh, went to. Long Beach men's this year. I've never been to Long Beach, so I want to go see them. But I've been, been to BYU, Long Beach, UCLA, Irvine, uh, Stanford. Um, so all men's programs, because that's the best time for me to be able to go watch other other teams. But what I've learned is in the men's game, 
you know, you guys know this. You, you got 25 guys on a team. You got to keep everybody happy. You got a lot of big egos with big players. Um, and because uh, guys just are a little bit different, right? So I've learned the art of kind of massaging, you know, and learning how to talk to, to our players more like I've seen the men's coaches do it. It's uh, not getting in their face. It's, it's just, hey, we think this might be better for you. This, this could work out better, you know. What do we have to get, you know, let's watch videos so we can get you to buy into what we're trying to teach here. Let's, so we're going to move to this position because it helps this player, this player, and it'll really help our team, and we think you can go here. So I've learned the art of coaching a little bit, studying the men's game. And I, I, and I think the men, the way, the way the men's coaches coach is pretty cool. Well, and John, I think... You, you talked, talked about, about it a little bit, bit too, uh, and what, what I've seen, seen from you is your investment in the relationship and the things that you're asking these athletes to do is in the context of this really committed relationship and they feel safe with you and there's this trust with you that you've worked on the front end to develop and to build. And I think that goes a long, long way in helping an athlete feel good about, hey, I'm, you know, I'm being asked to make these kind of changes, either mechanically or positionally or, you know, whatever the case may be, having, having a relationship where you can make those asks and they understand that, hey, this is coming from, you know, something that we've established where I trust that Coach Cook has you know, has my long-term best interest in mind. He wants what's best for me. He wants what's best for the team. He wants what's best for our organization in general. And I'm not just some kind of, you know, it isn't just his will that's being pushed upon me. It's this kind of collective, you know, culture that we've got. And so I think you have the trust of them really goes a long way in, in the buy-in process and being able to have those conversations, huh? Uh, Chris, you said it better than I could say it, and uh, you know I think you do a whole podcast on relationships and building that trust. Um, but I, I think you also nailed it when you said I used to impose my will on my players. That's a great way to say it. It's, just, it's my way. This is what we're doing. Shut up and do it. And just there's no no massage in there. No, but. Again, after 2009, I, I made a lot of changes, and I, mean, I wrote a book about it. And the, that's one of the things that I realized. I had to build relationships with our players uh, so that they could trust me. And I had to invest time in, in, in getting to know them, being on their turf, uh, putting myself in their shoes. And that takes a lot of time and energy when you got 15, 16 players. But that is a commitment I've made, and uh, I, you know, I think it's critical to, to coaching this generation and, uh, and and be able to do things like that where you, they have that trust. And Mike, we were talking earlier, um, you know, the way that trust shows up isn't always gentle, right? You, you said you saw John coaching uh, in, the, in the national championship match and in a way that maybe he couldn't otherwise if he didn't have that trust, huh? Uh, there are some, some coins in the emotional piggy bank that, uh, as Rob Browning would say, so yeah, and that's what people may not know when they see coaches getting after getting after the player. You know, the big one that was all over the media was Michigan State's basketball coach lighting up his kid in the tournament, and uh, they don't know the relationship that those two have built. You know, over the course of the season, and it turns out they went to the Final Four and had and had a, and overachieved. And so it's 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 easy to be judgmental when you maybe don't have a really good sense of. Uh, of what's gone into it, but uh, yeah, it's. I like I like how Rob Browning puts it. You got to put, put some coins in the emotional piggy bank, bank for sure. Yeah, because yeah, every once in a while, while you want to take a big withdrawal. withdrawal. You, you want to go <laughs> take this player and and move them in a in a, in a way that they don't want to be moved. And yeah, yeah if, if you're, you're going to go, go make that big withdrawal, you have to you have to have made some solid deposits along the way. <laughs> yeah. All right, we got a couple more questions, and then I'll let you get going off to practice here. I know you have practice coming up. Um, when you have a young team like you had, and you guys are trying to prep for a run in the tournament, how have your practice plans, or how did they change through that through the course of that season? Are you, 
you know, early season practice planning, mid season practice planning, and then going into the tournament, what adjustments are you making with a team like that? Well, I think if you ask any of our former players at 310, what are you guys doing in the Nebraska gym? At 330, what are you doing? At 415, what's the drill? They could probably recite every drill at the set at the same time as it happens every day. I, I love routine. I think players love routine. So we do a lot of the same drills over and over and over throughout the season. It doesn't matter whether we are in the beginning of the season or at the end of the season. So in the way we break down our practices are basically the way I simplify it. So the first hour is working on fundamentals. So the fundamentals of the game, you know, there's, you know, serving, passing, blocking, setting, all those things. So we're going to we're going to review fundamentals. I think if you if you stop working on those, you're and I learned this lesson when the first international trip I took a team on. We started and we played great. By the end of the second week, we were off on like what team is this? What happened? We couldn't do anything right. We couldn't base release. We couldn't you know do footwork. It was just like went out the window. And what I thought what I learned was. We're not drilling this every day, so they forget it, and it went away. And so I think you got to, you know, if you want to be good at it, you got to rehearse it every day. Um, just like serving, you want to be good servers, you got to serve every day. So that's one of the things we try to do as we get to the tournament. The thing that I add in um, is that we're going to work on big plays to determine the matches in the tournament. So, for example, we work on hitting over passes. Because at some point in a big game in the NCAA tournament, there's going to be an overpass. And we're going to kill it, or we're going to give it back to them, or we're going to be in the net. So we'll go back and, and use those examples. Uh, you know, that's an example I'm using right now. We're going to review how, how we get overpass. We're going to simulate that in practice. So we're going to be in a six on six drill, and I'm going to have our, you know, whoever's controlling the first ball, they're going to fire overpasses up there. So we're working on being ready when that happens, because that could be a defining moment of a big game, just that one play right there. And I've seen it over and over and over, just just overpasses. You're making me cringe. You're bringing back some bad memories here. We need to work on some overpassing in our gym. <laughs> so, but I mean, that's an example. I hope that answers the question. Um, so we're going to figure out what do we, what do we want? You know, what's going to be a big? And so we'll throw that in. I call it national championship points. This is going to be a play that's going to determine whether we win or lose a national championship, get there, or or an NCAA tournament match. Because everything tenses up in the tournament because it's you know one and done. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting, John. I think that's. A lot of young coaches that I talk to feel like there has to be novelty in their practices or the players will lose interest. Right? Hey, I've got to introduce new, new activities or new drills or we've just got to be doing something fresh all the time or the players will lose interest. And what I've found is like the good coaches kind of figure out, hey, we don't need to entertain the players all the time if we can get to a level where we're competing we're learning we're getting better they can work within this framework of routine and the improvement and the perfection and the push to get better becomes novel enough or entertaining enough for these really good players and so i think it's interesting to hear you say hey we really value routine and we do a lot of the same stuff because a lot of the coaches that I talk to, especially young coaches, don't feel that way. It's like, hey, I need to entertain the players in practice or they won't stay engaged. And I think you found, and certainly it's been my experience, that isn't the case with, uh, with high-level players or even low-level players. For that yeah. And Chris, I've, I've never heard our players say, oh, we're doing the same thing again. Like I said, I think we're all creatures that we like routine. I think they feel safe with routine. And we try to take that and we travel and everything we do is in our routine. Um, but the other thing I'll say in that is, now, we may tweak the drill, but all our drills, and this is what I would say for younger coaches, you either put a time on your drills, so we're doing this drill for three minutes, go. Okay? Or we're going to score it. We're going to compete. That keeps them fresh. 
or we're going to do a drill where you go ahead and get so many in a row to get a big coin, we're not leaving until you get five big coins. So we're going to put a goal on it. And I think what I see a lot of young coaches are they just go and drill. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no purpose to it. So I think that's one of the things we do, even though we're doing the same drills. One day it may be a competitive drill. One day it may be we're here until we get so many. One day it might be we're just doing this for time today. And uh, so I think that is a key in when you're designing a practice and drills is having, you know, those criteria on it. On it. Right. Mike, maybe a couple more questions, huh? Yeah, we'll end with a bench question here. Uh, you regularly lead the nation in lowest opponent hitting percentage. And so they're wondering, it's a, it's a broad question, but what is your approach to really good team defense? And uh, if we have time, maybe, you know, do you have an approach of stopping a really good attacker? Are you guys getting specific reps in practice for specific attackers you're going to face in the tournament and stuff like that? Kind of a tactical question. Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, defense to me is an attitude. I just told you I coached football. I, def I ended up being a defensive coordinator in my third year in high school football. Um, so to me, defense is about attitude and effort and preparation. And so uh, offense is more skill. You know, you, you got a great hitter, okay, you got a great hitter. But defense is a total team part of it. It's attitude, effort, like I said, preparation. So that's the first thing. We work on it every day. And so in developing that mindset. So we're, I want our team to be known. We're going to – defense wins championships. You hear that all the time. And I tell them. Every night we can play defense. Some nights the setter may be off, maybe the hitters are off, maybe the passers are off, but we can always play defense. You know, and that's you know half the time you're you're serving and getting a chance to play defense. So we're going to see ourselves and train ourselves that way. We're not going to be the most creative offensive team. We're not going to spend all this time around all these plays. We're going to spend a lot of time on becoming a great defensive team. And and the preparation part is. Figuring out what we can do well. So, for example, I, we have five NCAA blocking titles before we ever start swing blocking. I call it attack blocking, but going to BYU and talking to Chris and, and his dad changed my philosophy on blocking. So, there's a great change that we made over time. And we did it because one of our setters was small. So, I knew if we just put her out there in the Big Ten and had her stand out there and block, it was. There's no, she had no chance. But by the time you're running the jump to block, it completely changed how we trained and put our defensive system in. And that's why I went to BYU and studied and learned, and, and we changed it. And we still continue. We were, I think we finished one or two in the nation this year in opponent attack efficiency, and we're always one or two in the Big Ten blocking. So I don't know the answer to the question, but you got to adapt and change depending on your personnel. And, again, we train the mindset and still that in our players. Yeah, two of the best setters in the world right now in the men's game are these little guys. Maru for Iran and then uh, the French setter. And Tony Uli. Tony Uli. Yeah, they, yeah. they make these big swing blocking moves, but then they're not getting high over the net. And I don't know if it's the hitters get, you know, they get a little greedy or what, but these guys are soft blocking everyone in the world and being fairly effective at it. So, yeah, I think we're going on a little, a little bit into the weeds here, but yeah, we can get a short setter and still get lots of touches making that type of move for sure. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's it for today. And, uh, John's off to his practice or in spring practice right now. And we just want to say thanks for your time and your insight. And, uh, it's a pretty interesting topic, and uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just honored and privileged to be on this and know that I got Chris off the sea slope. So, <laughs> John, we love you guys, and, uh, and just are so, I don't know, just proud of the program and proud of the work you're doing. And uh, I just uh, I really appreciate the time. And, um, you know, go smack Jalen in the head for me, tell him to work harder here. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing a great job. You know, uh, He's a good kid. So that kid works hard. He does, yeah. Talk about passion. Yeah. I'm going to anybody come to our practice and why you want to see passion, watch him coach. And, yeah. you know, I know you know him really well. So feel very lucky. But, uh, anyways, great to be on. We've got to do it again sometime. Okay. Thanks, Thanks again. again. Yeah. We'll talk to you.
Thanks.